Welcome! You're listening to the Creative Women's Call podcast with Agnieszka and Ari, where we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of having a small business and being a creative woman entrepreneur. This is episode 6 with Ari and Sharkina Pazan. Hey everyone, it's so amazing to just kind of have this special podcast session because this specific episode, I'm just super excited because I have, I mean, we have Sharokina Pazan. Am I actually pronouncing your name right? You are. And you can call me Totally, totally easy. Okay. (laughs) Just call her Shar, everyone. Um, Okay. So um, Shar is actually a... um, business owners, right? A uh, creative business owners in Chicago and she owns City Girl. And I don't know about you guys, if you check out her website, it's just like so elegant and it's just amazing the work that she did. I've known her for a few years now through our mutual um, mutual event um mutual friend um Sharon Ringer. And only recently I personally got a chance to see her in action at the uh Daisy Foundation Leading Ladies Luncheon in April. And it was just amazing to see her energy coordinating and seeing her work as a guest in that event. So I was lucky to be there and um it was great job, Shar. That's all I can say. Um and yeah, thank you so much for being here with us um, at this podcast. Thank you so much for having me and for all the kind words. I don't know if I deserve all of that. <laughs> oh, you are. Come thank on. You. Own thank it. You, you have so to much. own it, right? <laughs> one, from one great woman to another, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. So, sure. Tell us a little bit more about who you are and what's your day to day work look like. Sure. So um, as you know, I'm Shar and I own City Girl Events. We're a full service wedding and event planning company um, based in Lincoln Park, but we travel. Uh, We just got back from a big conference in D.C., um, you know, focused on sleep for adolescents. And then we came back the next day and we did a, a leading ladies luncheon. So really the scope of the events that we handle are really in the verticals of anywhere from, you know, weddings or lifestyle events, um, tech, fashion Uh, And really just any client that comes to us that has a really interesting concept or idea and that they're, what's important is that they're very passionate about what they're doing and it gets us excited to help transform their idea into an event for their guests. Wow. Um, Yeah, it's very cool. I feel very lucky to get to do what I do every day. Absolutely. That's the power of just like really pursuing your dream, right, Char? So, okay. Speaking of dream, actually, (laughs) and... (laughs) There's a good question coming after this one. So I noticed that your very first business was in grammar school, which is super interesting considering where you are today. Um, Ah. Yeah. So do you want to share with us a little bit about that? Sure. So basically, I mean, it was my very first entrepreneurial venture, and I can't actually remember how long it lasted, but um, (laughs) I figured my dad and I one day went to the dollar store and we noticed that at the time it was airheads or warheads or, you know, the candy that, that gets really sour and then it becomes sweet. Um, it was all the rage, uh, when we were in school and I noticed that I could buy a pack of the candy in a big bag. And then what I thought was, Oh, kids love these, you know, these pieces of candy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to buy them in bulk and I'm going to sell them during lunch. So I think I did it for a little bit, not years and not, probably not months, but it was a very cool, I thought at the time idea. Um, but I mean, what kid thinks to do things like that? I mean, usually kids in, at lunch are trying to trade lunches or, you know, Ooh, the boy has cooties over there or he's really cute. I don't know, but, <laughs> like, but it was a very fun thought looking back and saying, wow, like what was I even, why was I even excited to do that? Why were my gears turning in my head with that? Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was it was a really cool experience for the short time that it happened. That's amazing. I mean, like I know I when I was in high school, I didn't even think about doing something on the side to get like extra money for, you know, your pocket money and things like that, right? But why didn't I do that? Like seriously, now that I look right. back, I should have I done something. Do right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, the great at that, but <laughs> you know, we didn't have that technology way back when. I know, but hey, it's probably different now with the kids today. Anyway, <laughs> to, uh, so Shar, tell us a little bit about your story and how did you actually get to do the things that you love doing today? Uh, what was that 
long journey look like? What was your path look like before City Girl events? Sure. So I, you know, I went to University of Illinois at Chicago, go UIC, woohoo. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I always wanted to, um, you know, work in marketing. And I also thought it would be fun to own something and be an entrepreneur. And I remember, you know, writing a business plan. I wrote one for a marketing company and one for a, an event planning company. And I just thought, you know, wouldn't it be so cool if I could be an event planner? But I thought, you know, I'm supposed to go and become the director of marketing somewhere by the time I'm 40. I don't really mm -hmm. think I should be following this event planner thing. So, you know, with, with school, you know, they really taught you, okay, you're getting on a path before you graduate, you have to have a job, you know, get into, you know, sales or marketing and kind of grow within a field and become an expert in what you do. And so I did, I got my first job at career builder right outside of, you know, out of college and I did uh, cold calling, outbound sales um, calling for a little bit. And while it was interesting and I learned a lot, I didn't feel passionate about doing that. I don't know a lot of people that are passionate about cold calling, but um, there, I'm sure there are. So I did that for a little bit and then went to work for a manufacturer doing um, sales support and then some marketing for them. And that's when I, I realized, you know, I really feel like, I get to work with great people here, but I feel like something's missing. And I feel this entrepreneurial drive that I really need to, to fulfill. And so I started the event planning. Um, and I had been doing event planning here and there for my cousins and family friends, like, you know, throughout college. And because everyone was older than I was, and they would say, Oh, you're so organized. Can you look up invitations? Can you look this up for me? You're so good at this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know what this stuff was. And so I would kind of just help out when needed. And then, um, you know, really digging into the event planning world, I was looking through things and I thought, you know, I think I could be really good at helping people create their vision. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I started part-time, uh, just kind of events by Sharokina. I started it, I put out an ad and, um, and again, I had done a few events, but nothing under my company name. Uh, and so I started small and I did a, a few events and, you know, I got good feedback. So I thought, you know, maybe there is something to this. So in February of 2010, I gave my two weeks notice. I um, came back, uh, you know, to, to home. Um, I went to a vacation for about a, a week or two um, to India with some friends and my husband. And we came back and I said, okay, now I'm in my home office. Now what? I'm, you know. I, I don't know how to run a company. I've never done it before. I'm just, I'm sitting here, you know, in my home office thinking, did I make a mistake? Like, this is really cool. What do I do? Th there are things that go through your head. You, you panic a little bit, then you're really excited. Then you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know if that's what I should be doing right now. And of course you have like little to no clients. Um, so what I did was I just, I networked. I went out, I figured out, okay, this is where I'm going to go. I'm going to go meet people. Um, and that's how I started. And I started, I quit with two events on the books and I ended up with 12 events that year. And wow. then I just kept going, you know, that's it's just, you just got to meet people and have them give you a chance. Yes. So. Um, that's just amazing. I mean, like the way you actually take that leap, right. And even though the journey or the life of entrepreneurship is always up and down, like all the time, right. As long as you do not stop you'll get there. Right. Right. The only person that's going to stop you from succeeding is you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are your own worst critic or your best friend. Yeah. When you do this. So, <laughs> that's so right? true. It is. I mean, why can't, why, why do people, I, I was working with, um, you know, I, I started to lift, um, which I think is so funny because I have no athletic bone in my body. And I remember my, my trainer, I was lifting this super heavy weight which for me, 85 pounds is very heavy. Um, I'm probably very wimpy. And I'm lifting it and I'm going, oh, I don't think I can get one more. And he said, think of something that really energizes you or really gets you mad or feel powerful. And I lifted it and it helped me lift two more just because I put my mind to it. I, I was done. I was done lifting. So when I think about what the power of your mind can do, mm -hmm. like, you can do anything. If you said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to move, you know, this weight, or I'm going to 
um, start this business or I'm going to help others by doing this. If you put your mind to it, there's nothing that can stop you. I totally agree with that one. Yep. Okay. So from there, actually, what will be, I guess, if you can look back, what was the biggest challenge of getting to where you are today? And um, was there any tips that you can share with us on how you overcome it? Sure. I think the challenges were, for me at the time, it was age. I was Mm -hmm. very young. I was 24. Um, So people, you know, didn't take me as seriously in the beginning or they thought, oh, she's new to the industry. There's so many new people, Um, you know, but I, I think with age, it's just a matter of whether you're older, whether you're younger, it, it shouldn't matter. It should really be about what you bring to the table. And if you bring an air up and, you know, uh, an, uh, an atmosphere of professionalism with you. I know that's the wrong word. I can't think of the word right now. But if you come at it with a professional attitude, nothing's going to stop you. People are going to take you seriously. I think the other challenges were sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Um, you know, I knew how to do marketing and sales um, and event planning, but I didn't know, you know, the website or accounting or bookkeeping. So I had people in the beginning, um, like my husband was amazing and he helped me with my very first website. Um, So he helped me with that and my first logo. I had, um, you know, other people helping me with other things. Um, Really, either it was for trade or, you know, they helped me out for little to no money because they believed in me. And so it's a matter of, and some things I learned how to do on my own. So I think it's a, a mix of what is it going to take for you? Does it make sense for you to learn how to do this one thing so that it saves you time and money later on? Or is it better to outsource those things, find a friend that maybe you can trade services with, you know, because they're starting something new too, and they're good Mm -hmm. at one thing, you're good at the other. Or, you know, it's hard because you don't also want to overspend. My, My business, I didn't have any money that I, you know, um, filled it with in the beginning. It mm-hmm. it was self built, so even to this day, the business has been self built. It's never had an influx of cash put into it. So mm-hmm. everything that we make is from what we bring in um, from business. So it's just being resourceful, and there's always somebody willing to help you out. So yeah. I think that if you go into it and you you ask someone, you say, "Hey, I, I really need help with this. I don't know how to do this." There are free resources. There are experts that know what they're doing. There's always a way to get what you need um, if you just look for it Mm -hmm. and you network. Yeah. But one thing that I would definitely like to add to that one is also be realistic about what you ask, you know, because when you're trading services or doing the barter kind of way in the very beginning, don't be (laughs) unrealistic when asking that you want this amazing website doing so many um, amazing things right away that's just not realistic so making sure that whatever you're requesting from the other party or the other friend and things like that make sure it's realistic and um yeah just be mindful on what you're actually asking don't ask like absolutely just like this big gigantic request and they just like no yeah just don't do that. No, absolutely. No, I agree with you. And you start slow steps too, right? Mm-hmm. So my website mm-hmm. didn't come overnight. So I think it's one of those things too, where, you know, you start small, you know, just like with Apple, right? So mm-hmm. an iPhone, that's why there's an iPhone seven or eight, or I don't know where we're at right now. I think it's seven, but each seven. version of the <laughs> iPhone that comes out, I'm like one of them, but each Apple iPhone that comes out, there's always a new edition. There's always mm-hmm. the better version. There's always the 2.0 version, you know, what yeah. have you. I think that's important. It's you start small and you build and you grow. You don't want to start open the doors and have everything right away. Um, you need you also as an entrepreneur need time to process everything. So yeah. asking somebody to barter with you for this, you know, high tech website with thirty tabs and all of this <laughs> oh stuff. I mean, God. it's not realistic to ask from them, but also you might not need all of that. So you start small and you you work up. Keep it simple. Yeah. Um, keep your requests simple and realistic and respectful. Um, I agree with you and you'll go far. It has to be a win-win for both parties. Has oh, yeah. to be. Definitely. Um, okay. So 
moving on to the next one, I want to talk a little bit about um, how you define a social expectation while you running your own business, whether it was a social expectation from your family, your friends, or even your colleague in your industry. Do you have any of those experiences with you, Char? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so being a female entrepreneur, I think is always, there's always a struggle because you know, you have people that say you can do it all. Um, and so there's all this pressure to think that you're going to start the business. You're going to have this amazing marriage with these kids and pets and see your family and see your friends and you work out and all this, like, it's not, my firm belief is that it's, it's possible to have everything you want, but not all at the same time. I think the other good part to that is if you had everything that was perfect in your life, all at the same time, you wouldn't be able to appreciate it. You need different things to happen in different points of your life sometimes so that you can actually take in what's happening at that moment and absorb it and grow with it and enjoy it. Um, and so like for me, it's, it's, you know, I got married at 24 and that's when I started the business. And so people thought, okay, kids are coming really soon. No, kids are great. Kids are, if people choose to have kids, they're wonderful. And I hope to God that I, you know, I'm, you know, blessed to have kids one day mm -hmm. if that works out. But the reality is kids while I'm, you know, working and starting a business, some people can do it really great. For me, it wasn't in the picture. I felt like I needed to have my business to a certain point where it was not that it was running on its own, but I felt like it was okay enough so that I could bring in, you know, kids and dogs are not similar. I can bring my dog to work oh, yes. um, and some people bring their kids to work and they're very lucky to do that. But with an event planning business, you know, we're out and we're at meetings all the time and going here and there. And, um, and so I thought, you know, for me, it's the social expectation of people, some people stop, you know, they came up to me, they're like, we're going to stop asking, you know, if you're going to have kids. And I said, you know, that's fine. You know, I'm not living my life for other people's timelines. Yeah. I'm living my life for my timeline. So as much as people have expectations of, oh, she got married a while ago. When is she going to have kids? That's mm -hmm. great that you really are excited for me and want me to have kids, but it's not my time. And I'm not going to conform to that. Mm -hmm. um, also, the other thing was when I started working from home, when I first started my business, I didn't have an office space like I do now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the family and friends, even though they were supportive, they'd say, oh, well, you're home. Can't you go pick this up for me or run this errand? Um, I, in the beginning, I did because I, I wanted to be helpful. But yeah. then I realized if I wanted to be successful, you have to set your office hours. You have to know exactly when you're going to work. You have to be so much more disciplined when you work from home because you're thinking, ooh, you know, if you have kids, you're thinking about what you have to do with the kids or, you know, you have to, as a woman, you know, because um, you're the one usually bearing the child. So you're yeah. kind of usually hopefully share the duties with your husband or, you know, or, you know, the, the child's parent uh, co-parenting, but I think it's it's interesting as if you can really, you know, separate your personal life from your business life to a certain extent, I think that's an expectation that um, social expectation that just because I'm working from home doesn't mean that I can run errands for you and pick this up and do this. Oh, yes. Yes. I, I can be flexible if I want to, <laughs> but... That's I'm just, not going to just drop everything all day. I mean, Ari, you yeah, can relate to that, right? Absolutely. Uh, I think, I don't know where do they actually, then again, it could be because um, it's an older uh, mindset. Or I mean, like a lot of the um, yeah. older people probably tend to have this mindset because they don't really experience working from home, right? I mean, the generation, us with the yeah. millennials, we see that as a norm because we see people all the time at a um, coffee shop or working from home become becomes such I guess like a normal thing to say and for our older generation that just like oh does that mean now you can just like do whatever it's like um no that's not really what it means right, <laughs> it's, like, right. it's just right. it's just like I, ha I think there has to be some education part where we can let them know that even though we are working from home, we do have like a specific um, schedule where we focus on our own work. And then there will be a time where uh, we can like do family time together or something like that. So yeah, I relate so much on that, that you experience as well, Shar. Yeah. 
No, it's true. It's just, it's separating, you know, your personal from your business. And, Mm -hmm. and and it is nice too, right? Because you have the flexibility. You can decide if you want to go, you know, if you have kids, you want to go to your kid's baseball game, or, Mm -hmm. you know, if you have friends in town and you just say, you know what, I'm going to get all my work done. I'm going to shut the office down for a day. I mean, Mm -hmm. that, that is a perk, but it's, but it's, yours to set not other people's social expectations of you because you are quote unquote available yes I think all that's right that's amazing <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that um i know that i'm not the only one like feeling this right um okay <laughs> right we all go through it <laughs> and the next one that i really want to really ask you so we pretty much learned so much growing up while building our lives and the business, right? And as I was actually looking for a new Kindle book the other day, or it was like a few days or something, I saw this recommendation for a book, which very interesting title called Adulthood for Beginners. It's by Andy Boyle or something yeah. like that. And I'll definitely include that wow. in the show notes. And one thing that I saw on that book is this quote that I really want to elaborate with you. Um, Everyone makes a mistake and you shouldn't be super mean to people because of it. That's what it says. And now I think that quote, we should always remember. And I just thought of you, Char, because you are really a down to earth kind of person. And I think you are always kind to many people you met, strangers that come in um, to our Creative Women's Co events at your space. And I just feel like you're a great example of people who should be kind to one another. But now I'm a bit curious, has there been a time where you have this experience where either your client or um, a colleague that you know being super mean when you're making a mistake? Oh, (laughs) yes. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, did I laugh? Um, (laughs) So I, I think... Right. Um, so here's here's the thing about event planning. It's the best education I think I've ever. I love my university and my high school and and every you know every institution I've been through. But this this business has been my teacher. <laughs> I've definitely been its student. That's for sure. Um, and what I've learned is this. I mean, I've been doing this since '09 um, professionally. What I can tell you is. Each, you don't know what every person's going through, right? So mm-hmm. imagine when we get up in the morning, you know, um, you either wake up on the quote unquote right side of the bed or wrong side of the bed. You know, you can get up, you, you know, the birds are chirping, the sun is shining, you know, everything is going right. You know, you brush your teeth, you take a shower, whatever your daily routine is, it could be perfect. Or you could get up, stub your toe, you know, run out of toothpaste, you know, your shampoo, you're out of that. You are, you know, running late to work. So there are a series of things that can contribute to everyone's daily, you know, morning start. And so, you know, usually my clients are either in school or they go to work and then they come to a meeting with us or they meet us. So at that point, I mean, I don't know what they've gone through that day. Mm -hmm. Um, Not only daily, but, you know, people are going through illnesses, they're going through um, mental health issues, they're going through um, when they're planning an event, they have not only their parents usually, but in-laws that they're dealing with. And so Mm -hmm. it's a big life change. So imagine all of these different stressors that are put on each individual person. And now we're planning, you know, if it's a wedding, we're planning one of the biggest day of their lives. Um, And not just from a financial standpoint, which money stresses everybody out usually, um, but also it's the two families coming together. Or it's, you know, if it's a corporate event, you know, you're putting on an event, your boss Um, you know, gives you certain expectations or you have a committee you're working with. So imagine all of these stressors that could, you know, play a part in somebody's mental attitude of, you know, how they approach me. And now they're coming to my office or I'm meeting with them, you know, and I might say one thing that triggers this anxiety or this anger from them. It's not personal. You know, most of my clients are very reasonable people. I mean, almost all of them. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm very lucky that I've worked with some amazing, incredible people, you know, amazingly talented in what they do. They hire me to take the stress off and to help guide them as a consultant. So I just have to realize it's not personal. You know, when they come to me and they go, why isn't this done? Or what happened with this? It's I need to not internalize it because Mm -hmm. 
you know, they are looking to me, they hired me as the expert, they knew that they could come to me to, to help them do what, you know, whatever event, put it together. Um, and I just have to realize it's not personal. Yeah. Um, it, it's usually they've been through something. If somebody has yelled at me, they've apologized later. Um, I'm so sorry. I've been through a lot, you know, or whatever it is. Um, and a lot of the times, actually, what the interesting part is, they actually trust you more if they're going to yell. They're not yelling at you. They're not, they're more venting to you. Usually you mm. think about it. You will vent to someone that you trust that knows what you're going through and that you feel it can actually fix something. So yeah. if I change my perspective and I think about something and say, okay, this person, this, this human being that's in front of me is also a human being. They've also made mistakes or they've also gone through stressful things. We're relating on a human level. And so they think the world of me enough to come to me with their problem and want me to help them fix it because they trust me. If I just change my perspective on how I look at things, I will handle that problem so much more differently than if I feel like I'm constantly being attacked. So I think it's just about changing your, changing the way that you handle criticism or mm -hmm. stress because sometimes they aren't yelling at you. They're yelling at the situation. Um, yeah. Sometimes you do make a mistake and you just have to apologize and say, you know, I'm so sorry that this happened. The best thing is to ask them, you know, either if you can fix it, you say, absolutely, we fixed the situation. Here's what we did. I'm so sorry again. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. Or sometimes if it's after the fact, you ask someone, I'm so sorry that this happened, you know, whatever it is, what would make it better? What would it take to make it better? Mm -hmm. More than I think, I don't want to put a statistic on it, but I think at least three quarters of the time, people will just, they just want you to hear them out. Yeah. They won't even, half the time they won't ask for a refund. They just want to know that you listened, that you cared enough to, to listen to them, you know, about what they went through. Mm -hmm. And you learn from it and they feel better. And that's kind of how I, how I handle conflict. That's amazing. Actually, I just don't really, take it personally. Yeah. Really looking at it that way. Um, like I guess the saying says, right. It's not personal. It's just business, right? It's true. Because even if you get along with someone, you know, you and I could get along great, but when money is being put down, there's all, mm -hmm. there's all of a sudden a different layer to it. Yeah. And so we could grab a coffee, but if something is an issue, I just want to make sure as a, as a consumer, as a customer um, of your product that I'm taking care of, I'm being listened to. Yeah, that's a great point. You know? So that's, that's all it is. It's listening. That's just sharp. Thank you so much with all of these like amazing insights that you share with us. I'm pretty sure um, other people are experiencing some of these issues as well, right? And just kind of figuring out, okay, how do I yeah. deal with all this kind of thing? And um, your perspective, your pretty much experiences might be very helpful to other people who's currently dealing I with these so. situations. Yeah, I'm pretty sure so. Because <laughs> at least for me, it's like the last one that you mentioned, that's really um, a good one. Because I know sometimes at our own company, sometimes we handle things like that as well. So it's great to know that from your own perspective, um, I can definitely take a couple of insights um, and apply it to my own um, company too. So fantastic. That's just okay. great. Yeah. So Shar, great. where can, you. yeah, where else can we find you other than your website? And um, where can we pretty much see more of what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can check us out on Instagram, um, you know, and we're pretty active on Instagram. We have over 3,000 3, users um, at City Girl Events is our handle. Um, you can also, again, find us on our website, citygirlevents.com. Um, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter, um, City Girl Weddings, I think, or Wedding on Twitter. Um, we were just featured on the Married at First Sight season five. So you can check us out on Lifetime if you want to watch the shows. Um, it's a national reality TV show. We were the featured planners and we, um, you know, helped coordinate some of those weddings. So check out the Married at First Sight show on Lifetime. See, I told you guys, she's just amazing, right? Oh, well, uh -huh. okay. Thank you. So, thank you for yeah. <laughs> okay, Char, thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. We hope you have a great day and stay tuned for our next episode. Bye. This episode was sponsored by Chikalafia Design and Wardrobe Image Photography. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you have an amazing day.